Thank you very much. Good. I, I, obviously, I did forget, so thanks a lot. <laughs> So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, forget uh, general relativity for a few minutes, at least, because we're just going to do Newtonian mechanics. So, Keplerian orbits. Uh, the reason we're doing them is uh, that we will very shortly look at the orbits of stars in a, or planets in a, um, in a Schwarzschild field, and then we we'll want to compare them to something. So I could just say, well, you've done this exercise in your um, theoretical mechanics class, I think, just work out the Keplerian orbits. So just look it up there, but it kind of, it's kind of nicer just to have everything together. In, in one place. So, in other words, we take uh, Newtonian gravity, uh, we look at the equations of motion m x, so m naught acceleration is equal to the gradient of uh, the Newtonian potential, so that would be, uh, let's see, minus the gradient of the potential, so minus of minus g m naught m over R. Uh, let me just make sure that right that I have the right notation. So of course M naught cancels out, as we've always known. Uh, the minuses cancel out, become pluses, and the gradient of all this. Uh, so let's see. So I'm going to have uh, uh, something like that, right? The the gradient is one over R square. Uh, there's a minus coming from um, 1 over r, so we get gm over r square times the unit outwards vector, which is x over r. So please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's the right equation. So, uh, and we want to uh, uh, find the solutions, right? So find the solutions. Uh, and these are the famous Keplerian orbits. Of course, we want r non-zero, so it uh, should be clear. Uh, well, the first observation is uh, to notice uh, that the orbits are planar. So all solutions so the solutions are what we're going to call the orbits. First, it's shorter to write than solutions. So all orbits are planar. So there should be a simple argument which says that the, if the initial velocity is radial, along the radius, then the solution is uh, radial. Uh, anyone has a suggestion? Simple argument, if the, uh, uh, if uh, x dot at zero is proportional to x, then uh, x of t uh, is uh, uh, x of 0 is proportional to x of 0. So we say it's radial, right? So initial data are radial because the velocity proportional to x0, then uh, the solution is proportional to x0. So any simple argument for this? I mean, I can think of five complicated ones, and I'm sure that I had some simpler arguments before, but... Uh, maybe just that the gradients that you get with x, maybe it was 
told them to aim their angular direction, so you just force the cannoli move there because they've got the line to intersect into the cannoli. Say it again. <laughs> um, that because we have that grain with the elevation vector, it's really just kind of R dependent. It's going to be orthogonal to anything that varies in different directions in, in say, complicated time and space with a simple and arbitrary directions. And so you're always going to use a straight line. Good. So, that, that, so there's one argument here. Uh, somebody, uh, anybody has another argument to suggest? So, so one would be the following, and I mean, th this case is going to follow from the other one anyway, but it's somehow annoying that one needs to split them. But uh, so, uh, let's see. So uh, you can write an ansatz for the solution that x of t is a function uh, times x of 0, right? Put it in, you're going to get an equation for this one function and which you can solve. And then uh, you can say, well, by uniqueness of solutions, uh, I found a solution, right? So this is the right solution. So that would be one way of doing this. Let me not write it down, and maybe we'll come back to this later uh, by a, a different argument, but that would be one way of doing. One way would be the thinking that Liam suggested. Uh, so now suppose, suppose not, right? So now, and uh, next. Uh, x dot of 0 is not proportional to x naught of 0, uh, then uh, these vectors lie in a unique plane, right? So there exists a plane uh, uh, in which they lie. Well, a unique plane in which x of 0 and x not of 0 lie. And, uh, and we use now a conservation of angular momentum. So the angular momentum is conserved. So J is equal uh, uh, M zero X vector product with X dot. So if it ever happens that by a accident, somebody coming from the English uh, culture comes to this lecture and ask me what this is, then this is, uh, uh, they write it as a wedge. Okay, they write it like that. So that's uh, the same in the uh, notation in, in the UK or some people as a cross product. This is a vector product of vectors, okay? So we have j, which is this function, and now we, we calculate uh, dj over dt. Well, what do we get? Well, m0 is obviously a constant. Well, I didn't say that, but everybody knows it's a constant. That's the mass of the moving object. And I get uh, first, uh, when I differentiate the first term, I get x dot uh, vector product with x dot, which is obviously 0 because they're parallel. And I get, uh, when I differentiate the second term, I get x times x dot dot. But this is motion in the central field, right? So x dot dot is proportional to x. So this is again 0. Good. Exercise that you all know. Now, to make things clear, because I'm going to use j in the Schwarzschild field, let me call this jn, the n standing here for Newtonian. OK, so this is the Newtonian angular momentum. And the angular momentum is conserved, right? So this vector, Jn, is orthogonal to both x and, on, and x dot. So uh, when uh, you, the initial data are in this plane, uh, uh, 
in some plane. This plane is a plane orthogonal to Jn, right? So, so lie, uh, and now let me continue here. Uh, so this is a parenthesis, lie in the plane orthogonal orthogonal to J. Initially, but then always, right? But then always. That's the formula, right? This is conserved. This uh, vector product belongs to the plane orthogonal to, to Jn, but then all, for all t. Right, x of t is orthogonal to Jn from this formula, so for all times, good. Uh, so, uh, so this uh, this takes care of the uh, of this case, and uh, so how can we come back to a? Um, so, in uh, if x of naught and uh, x dot are proportional, then the angular momentum would be zero. Uh, it's conserved all the time. Uh, it's conserved, so it's going to be zero all the time, but. Uh, if the uh, vector product of two vectors is zero, then there are proportional. Is this correct? I think it's true, right? If and only if, right? So, yeah. So if this is zero initially, that's zero all the time, then therefore uh, they're proportional all the time. So, so that's my, my formula here. Uh -huh. So also works. So maybe I uh, shouldn't have uh, uh, for a. I shouldn't have made the difference here, but somehow it is a slightly different case. Good, but so what is then the point? So all orbits are planar. So there exists uh, uh, always a, if, if you started in a plane, you stay in this plane uh, and then uh, so you can choose coordinates so that um, the uh, so that this is uh, uh, the equatorial plane. Uh, uh, this is the equatorial plane, and uh, the equatorial plane means that theta is by half. Uh, for all time, right? Theta of t for all t. And this means that Jn is just 0, 0, and a scalar Jn, well, and uh, which has whatever sign it has. Good. So this is our starting point to continue. So. We're using conservation of momentum, of angular momentum, to show that uh, the problem is uh, a planar problem. Yes, what next? So this uh, mysterious machine to erase the blackboard seems to be working today. But there was something funny. I was listening to a lecture of a colleague. And uh, sometimes you hear this thing. Can you, see the no can you hear the noise or not? No? So I think that this uh, system has a noise compensation uh, uh, active noise cancelling uh, system so that noises like that are just cancelled out. 
but it doesn't work all the time. So when I was listening to this lecture yesterday, this was completely silence, and all of a sudden you have this terrible noise. So, and I think that the way it worked is that it was, it was canceling the noise for one a moment, and then was amplifying it. So it was much worse on the recording than what I hear when I'm here. Good. So uh, next step is uh, conservation of energy. So uh, the energy is, uh, uh, let's see, it's probably something like that, m naught x dot square half plus the potential. Uh, plus the potential means minus g m m naught over r. So we have to uh, work out what uh, this thing is uh, using conservation of angular momentum. So we already know that the motion takes place uh, in a plane. So this is only, say, x of t, y of t. And I forget the third coordinate. Uh, and in polar coordinate, this would be r, cos, r of t cos phi of t. Uh, let me not write this of t because it just takes too much place. I didn't write it here, so, <laughs> uh, so this is r cos phi. Everything is functions of, of time. So I can just calculate the derivative. x dot is, there will be a term r dot and multiplying this. And there'll be another term, phi dot uh, r, multiplying the vector uh, <laughs> derivative, of course, is a uh, minus sign. And derivative of sine is cos of sine. Okay. So this Newtonian angular momentum will be m zero x uh, times vector x dot. So I need to take a vector product of this vector with this one. So maybe it was a stupid idea not to add the zeros here. So let me add them because maybe it's going to be clearer if I do at this third place. But uh, right, so somehow you have a zero here because you're going to make a vector product in two dimensions. Why well, one can do it, but this is in three dimensions, right? So 
uh, when you take the vector product of this time that, then uh, this is proportional to the position. So x vector with x is 0. So it's going to drop out. So then it's the same as, uh, therefore, the vector product of uh, this thing, which is r. Uh, and let me write it now like that, cos phi sine phi 0. And this guy, so this guy has a phi dot. And it has an r, which makes an r square. And this is minus sine phi cos phi 0. Right? So this, this term times this term drops out. And uh, I don't know how good you are at calculating uh, vector product. But I don't need to make any calculation because I know that, well, these two vectors are lying in the plane. So uh, therefore, the vector product will be orthogonal to this plane. So, so the zeros here are straightforward. Now, this is a unit vector. This is a unit vector. And they're orthogonal if you just calculate this, right? So the length of the scalar product is the length of the first times the first second times the sine of the angle. But they're orthogonal. So it's just uh, one here. Good. So in other words, uh, our Jn, which is conserved. Now, this vector is conserved. Therefore, its z component is conserved. So Jn is uh, m0 phi dot r square. And of course, I could have told you this immediately if you remember your classical mechanics. But I'm. OK, whatever. And so this gives me a, an equation for what d phi over dt is, right? d phi over dt, because this is concerned, then you get uh, Jn over m0 r square. And this is going to be probably our equation 1 today. Good. So next. Uh, we want to calculate the energy. And this, uh, again, I'm going to put an n here uh, because this is the Newtonian energy. And I don't want to get confused uh, later. So En is m naught half time the length of this vector square. So x dot square uh, plus the potential energy minus gm m naught over r. So I need to take this vector and square it. So the square of this vector will be the square of this one. But this is a unit vector. So time r dot square. Right? So r dot square from this and the square of this guy, which is 1. Then you get a twice cross terms. So scalar product of this one with this one. But they are orthogonal, right? So cos minus sine and sine times cos is 0. So plus 0 for the cross terms. And uh, I have the square of this one. This is a unit vector. So phi square r square. If I'm not sure uh, how to check this, well, uh, let's do this. Uh, we know what the metric, the flat metric, is uh, in uh, spherical coordinates. It's r, dr square plus r square d theta square plus sine square theta d phi square. So the length of a vector uh, g of x dot x dot is just r dot square plus 
r square theta dot square plus sine square theta phi dot square. So I could have spared myself this calculation because I know this formula. Theta dot is 0, right? We are just moving on the plane. Sine theta is 1 because we're moving on the equatorial plane. So this is this is my formula here, right? So I should have been clever and told you, come on, guys, we've been doing this for two months now, so we should know this. We should know better than doing this calculation. Good. Uh, so this was a check of this, but there's still a piece missing here, right? So minus g m m naught over r. And then if I continue, I can uh, use phi dot from equation one to get that this is, so e n is uh, m naught half r dot square uh, plus Ah, this becomes scary now. So let me just do it uh, uh, very slowly so that I have the coefficients correct. So the clever thing would have to be to say, well, let's take uh, m0 equal 1 uh, because we know that uh, uh, nothing depends upon M0, so do the calculation for a unit mass object. I wasn't clever enough to do this, so uh, uh, let's see. So what's, uh, there's a right, parenthesis missing here. Good. So I can probably simplify this a little bit. First, M0 factorizes. Uh, then, uh, so here I have no... No much to do here, but this thing, uh, maybe I don't want to, to factorize it because there'll be a 1 over m naught here, right? So plus j Newtonian square. There's a square, so 1 m0 stays. The half is here. So this one I have, 1, 0. And there's an R4 with this R square gives me a 1 R square. And, uh, and this one, right? Gm, M0 over R. Uh, OK. Good. But then uh, we know that the energy is conserved. I'm, I'm not going to prove this. Uh, so so uh, I hope you, you know this. So energy is conserved, so I get an equation for R dot, right? I can get an equation for R dot from this. And so this is going to be our equation two, uh, which is R dot square. And you know what? Let me just state uh, M0 equal one so that I don't have to worry about it. Uh, the formulae uh, with M not not equal one are all worked out in the book. so. It's going to be to minimize uh, the probability of errors that I do uh, in the calculation. So let's see. So we need to put this on the other side. So I'm not is one. I don't worry about this anymore. So I get two Newtonian energies uh, minus uh, so uh, minus this angular momentum term minus j n square. Uh, and the two probably goes away, right? Yeah. The two goes away. M0 R square. <laughs> I told you M0 is not there. Go away. But the retro satan has. Uh, good. And then this term is a plus and multiplied by two. Two G M over R. So this is our equation for the radial part. And uh, well, that's the point is to solve it, right? This one is uh, equation one is uh, once we've solved two, then one is straightforward because we get ex then explicitly r 
right? This is a function only of an equation which involves only r. We can solve it, put it into 1, and we get 5. Okay? So that's, uh, that sounds good. And, but one looks at that and says, well, what, how the hell am I going to solve this equation? And does, one, does anyone remember the trick to, to solve this? No? Okay, so I think I, I, it was probably a good idea that we, we do this here. So the trick now is to uh, uh, look at, uh, write an equation d u over d phi, where u is m over r. So, in other words, uh, we uh, don't view r as a function of t, but we go to a new function with m over r. Of course, this is then again a function of t, but we can use this equation to make, uh, well, the, this phi is a function of time, so we can just think of this equation as being t as a function of time, right? So, use this equation to... Uh, to change the uh, dependent variable. So, so that the, the key is, is, is two things here, right? So uh, d over d phi with u equal m over r. Uh, let's see. So I probably need uh, not to erase this. So let me just... Uh, do it like that. Good. So we want to calculate d over d phi, which is d m over r with respect to d phi, but d phi is uh, d phi over dt. Times dt. <laughs> So this is 1 over uh, well, maybe better to do this like that. So in other words, d over dt of m over r divided by d phi over dt. Maybe I should have written it like that. This looks a bit weird. So that's probably the, the right way to go. So this is now. Uh, d over dt of m over r is m over r square, dr over dt. And 1 over d phi over dt, so I'm using 1 here. So d phi over dt is here, and 1 over d phi over dt 
uh, m0 we to take 1. Uh, so this is r square over jn. So they cancel out nicely. And I get minus m over jn dr over dt. Good. Uh, but then I can calculate d over d phi square. So maybe let's call this equation 3. Is going to be uh, m square over jn square. Uh, then dr over dt square, which I get from here. So 2 en minus jn square over r square plus to gm over r. OK, so is there something interesting happening here? Please uh, check that what I'm doing is correct, right? So I, I, I just don't want to end up with the wrong equation at the end. So once again, d over d phi. So I differentiate this over time, this over time. Uh, m over r square, d r over dt. 1 over d phi over dt, that's r square over jn. m0 is 1. So r squares cancel out. We get this nice formula. And then dau over d phi is m square over jn square from here, d over dt square from this equation too. Two n minus jn square over square. Okay, good. And now, so the jn's cancel out here, so we get a, a complicated expression, which you will see we don't care about, but uh, that's what we can get here. But here. Uh, the jn's cancel out, so we get minus m square over r square. And this is great, because this is u square. Right? u was m over r. And this one is uh, plus 2g m cube. Well, let me keep m square. Because this is uh, u again. Right? This is u. So, so this is my equation. And just for fun, I'm going to call this coefficient u naught. So u naught is equal g m square over j n square. And there would be some m zeros floating around if the mass is not zero. Right. Uh, so probably, if you think about it, this is uh, j. If I set m zero equals zero, then j n is the angular momentum per unit mass. So maybe you can figure out uh, based on that where where m not should come in here. Good. Yes. Go ahead. Yes, there is. Thank you. OK, so we're going to set up a mistake counter here. One. Let's hope it stays at one. Good. So this is something which I don't care about, which you're going to see shortly. Minus u square plus 2 u u naught. This is my equation, d phi o, du over d phi. This is a constant, right? du over d phi square. Good. So now I could just probably uh, 
solve this equation directly, but I'm going to do something uh, uh, which I like doing, namely get a second order equation out of it, right? This is true for the whole time of the motion. I, how do I get rid of this constant here? I multiply this equation by d over d phi. Uh, let me call this equation now 4. So here I'm going to get 2 du over d phi du over d phi second derivative. Right? If I multiply this, I get a whatever rule you get. Then you can see why I didn't care about this term because it's zero if I differentiate it. So, but this one gives me minus 2u, and this one gives me plus 2u0. So now you understand why I absorbed this 2. Well, in my u0, I didn't include this 2 because now this cancels out. And uh, let's see, but uh, yeah, too fast. Let's not count this as a mistake because I'm correcting it in real time, right? So, so what's the derivative of this term? Minus 2u du over d phi, and here plus 2u0 du over d phi, okay? So the 2 cancels out, the du over d phi cancels out, and I get a very simple equation uh, for u, and I think probably at this stage I can erase everything here. Maybe I will need this equation jn is m0, which is 1 phi dot r square. Well, this one I should remember, but uh, in case I don't, then it's here anyway. Good. So let's get rid of this. This was one probably kind of uh, equation one, right? And not quite, uh, uh, well, a, a variation of this was equation one. Is this correct? Yes? No? Yes, I think so. Yeah, yes. essentially, right? I mean, it was written the other way around, but, but it's, it's uh, basically the same as equation one. Good, so now, so d to u minus u naught over uh, d phi square is equal minus u minus u naught. So this is our equation five. I have been very clever to add this u naught here <laughs> because u naught is a constant, so you can add it. And then this is just an equation which uh, 
uh, everybody and his dog can solve uh, in preschool. So u is equal u naught plus uh, some function, uh, some constant a cos phi minus phi naught. Uh, obviously, this constant u naught uh, is, uh, cannot be 0 because u was m over r. So r equals 0 would mean. So uh, therefore, I can redefine this constant by factoring this out. And then I can choose rotate coordinates so that phi naught is 0, right? rotate coordinates. OK, so this is my solution. So I have my u as a function of phi, and these are my orbits. Uh, uh, so now I have u as a function of phi. I, of course, know what m of uh, uh, is, right? Because this is m over r. So m over r is this. So I know what r, r of uh, r of phi is. Let's see. So r is equal. I have to multiply by r and divide. Divide. Uh, did I do something wrong? Maybe not. Okay. Good. So if I multiply by r, let me do it slowly because I'm going to do it wrong, right? So if I multiply by r, I'm going to get m is equal r u naught plus r. It's going to go away if I don't. Erase it properly. Uh, well, divide by u naught. Okay, that's one thing. So, that's, so we, we we don't have this term anymore. So we get r plus r e cos phi. And then uh, this is the same as r plus uh, r cos phi is just x. So e times x. Right. So. Uh, x is uh, x y is what you think it is. So r cos phi r sine phi. That was our starting point. Cool. So we have our formula for this orbit. Now somehow uh, this is uh, it's not. Completely obvious what this thing because thing is because it's in uh, polar coordinates, but now this is going to be in um, uh, so that could be, be equation six. This would be in uh, Cartesian coordinates, easier to understand. Let me check whether the equation is correct because if I have, a, have it wrong here, we'll be in back trouble. Uh, so far, everything looked to me spot on. OK, good. So this is the solution of the problem. Uh, so the question is, what is this, right? What, is, uh, uh, what kind of set it, it, is this? Not very helpful remark <laughs> to write, but uh, uh, right. So, so we, we we of course know what it should be. This should be uh, either hyperbole or uh, pyraboli or uh, ellipsi. And to see this, uh, you square six, take six square, 
you get r square, which is ix square plus y square, is equal m over divided by u naught minus square. I square this minus twice the product and plus e square x square. So I can rewrite this equation now as follows. If I take uh, everything to one side, I'm going to have uh, 1 minus e square x square plus uh, minus plus 2 e m over u naught x plus y square is equal m over u naught square. Good. So now you should be able to recognize the following. If this constant e is equal 1, then this drops out, and we get a parabola on the plane. If this constant is positive, we're going to get a, uh, the motion is bounded, and we get the equation for an ellipse. And if this constant is negative, the motion is unbounded, and we get a hyperbola. Right? Uh, also, if, uh, if this constant is zero, then the motion is unbo unbounded, we get the parabola. So I'm not going to write it down because that's something that you normally know from classical mechanics 101. And at our university, that's what? That's uh, T, uh, T1 or something like that, mechanics? T1, right? So you must have done this in T1. In any case, so these are the Keplerian orbits, right? So Kepler, well, I'm not sure whether this is the way that Kepler arrived at his uh, conclusion that uh, planets around the sun move around on an elli ellipse, uh, but that's Newton's version of, of this uh, argument. Uh, let me, uh, before I raise this equation, let me anticipate something. Uh, when we're going to derive a similar equation in the Schwarzschild geometry, we're going to get something very similar. So this constant will be different than this one. Uh, but this term will be the same. Well, this structure will be of, of the same form, but there will be an extra term. There will be this equation plus u3. So this is a spoiler. Uh, in Schwarzschild, you get something very similar for time-like geodesics uh, with uh, an extra u3 term. And that will allow us to compare them in a simple way, uh, because at large distances, while well, u being m over r, at large distances, u is very small, so a u3 term in this equation will be subdominant compared to these terms, and uh, that will allow us to treat this equation in a perturbative fashion. So, so we have our Newtonian orbits. Uh, yes, so one thing I want to do is to interpret this E uh, in terms of uh, the geometry. Um, again, a spoiler, this thing is called eccentricity, right? Uh, so eccentricity one means nothing happens, it's a circle. Eccentricity smaller than one uh, 
you get a, so for an ellipse, you have a eccentricity which is smaller than one or equal to one and one when it's a circle. And uh, so just to tie this to the terminology, uh, uh, to the definition of an eccentricity of an ellipse, there's a small calculation that one that we're going to do. Uh, in some sense, that's probably a, a waste of time to do this calculation because it's all just definitions. But, um, well, if you still wanted to make, to connect to geometry. So let's, uh, uh, well, it looks like I don't need to make any corrections here. So uh, the standard uh, form for an ellipse would be x minus x naught square over a square plus y minus y naught square over b square is equal one. Okay. That's uh, the textbook version. So in our case, one thing is obvious. Uh, y zero is zero, right? Y zero is, is zero because if I develop this, they're going to be uh, cross terms. I don't have cross terms. X naught I could calculate from, from here, but I don't care, right? So X naught equals something if you want to. Uh, you can try to do this in an exercise. It's not very useful. And this is today's uh, English exercise. And now, uh, if, uh, so the ellipticity is defined as follows. Uh, and I never know how this goes, but I think that uh, because there's, uh, this should be E0, not ellipticity, but eccentricity. And let me call this E0 square. Uh, this is defined as 1 minus b square over a square if when uh, uh, a is louder than b, right? So a is the, since a is louder than b, then this is a is the major uh, semi-axis, b is the uh, minor semi-axis, and the, this is the definition of the eccentricity, right? So, um, so you look at this equation and you wonder how this compares with uh, 7. I mean, we could just try to put 7 in this form to get uh, and work everything out, but so by compar comparing, um, uh, so if b is one, right? So if b is one, then uh, so so this equation would have uh, eight become well. Not, I had this cute argument of scaling, but just multiply, right? So 8 by times b square, you get uh, b square over a square 
x minus x naught square plus y minus y naught square is equal to 1. So uh, here is the coefficient is 1, here the coefficient is 1 of y square, right? So, so compare the coefficient of x square. One minus e square is equal to b square over a square, which is the same as saying that e square is equal to one minus b square over a square, which is e zero square. Good. So I don't know if you're confused now or not or anything, but so this uh, the point of this argument was to see that. This E, which appears here, is exactly what people uh, call eccentricity uh, for an ellipse. So, but I could just have told you that's a definition period. Maybe here is nicer because you see that this is uh, the difference between uh, 1 and the square of the ratios of the uh, semi-axis. And so therefore, certainly, if P is equal to A, then the uh, eccentricity is zero. I probably said something else right before. E1 is then, it's a, uh, yeah. good. For, forget what I said before. I didn't say anything. In fact, I've been, I haven't been talking at all during this lecture. So just, <laughs> if you happen to view it on YouTube, then just switch off the sound. Anyway. Um, so the point is the following. That's the equation for an ellipse. Uh, if we divide, multiply by base b square, we get this. So the coefficient of x square is when here we have 1, which is the case here. Then the coefficient of x square is b square over a square. But our coefficient is 1 minus a square. So this is uh, uh, in terms of these, the ratio of the length of the minor and major semi-axis, then um, this is our E. So now we know about everything. Oh, yes, one thing I wanted to do, uh, namely uh, the, uh, there's something which we're going to need later, the angular velocity of a circular orbits, right? So that's, um, that's, um, that's useful later. So let me just do this. Now at this stage, I only need a, uh, this equation, right, and um, well, this one I'm going to remember anyway. So this is uh, uh, so remember this equation, okay? I'm going to erase everything because I don't want to start. Erasing pieces, I want the whole blackboard. So, so remember the equation, or maybe write it now. Uh, u is uh, u is <sighs> okay. Let me write it here. U is equal uh, u naught one plus e cos phi. Okay, so this is a formula in terms of u, the same as equation six or something like that, or equivalent to equation six. And let me just start erasing.
well, a, a few more lectures and I can hire myself as a janitor. Uh, starts being pretty good. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so summary. Uh, well, so phi dot is equal to jn over r square. And um, u is uh, what I just wrote here. So let me just write it again. And uh, I should look up my equation for u naught. Uh, which vanish from the blackboard, but if you uh, look it up, uh, then this is uh, G. And uh, in fact, M0 square, M square over J Newtonian square, where E is the eccentricity of the orbit. Of the orbit. So let's see. Uh, let's take a circular orbit. Uh, and so now, uh, just last thing I'm going to do here is for further reference, uh, for comparison later. Uh, and the question is, what is uh, omega? d phi over dt on a circular orbit. Okay. Uh, and for this I need uh, uh, to use the... No, maybe I don't need to use much. Uh, Let's see, so uh, phi dot is j, j on n over r square. Uh, what's r on a circular orbit, right? So on a circular orbit, uh, you have r is, uh, t is equal r for all t. So the eccentricity is uh, zero. Right, u is constant, uh, so the eccentricity is, is zero. Uh, then uh, r is constant, so d phi over dt is constant, right? So omega is, uh, and this was phi dot, was it, uh, or phi dot square? Phi dot, right? Yeah, that's the equation here. Phi dot is uh, jn over r square, that's our omega. And this is uh, capital R now. And from this equation we have m over r is uh, g m naught, I'm restoring the m naught here, but you could probably take it to one again. So, uh, what do I do with this? Um, yes, I can probably calculate J. Okay. Uh, if I know the radius, uh, I don't necessarily know the, the angular momentum. Of course, I can calculate it from this formula. Uh, so, so I get Jn square is equal g m naught m r. Okay. 
So omega Jn over R square, so square root of G M naught square M R divided by R square. So M naught factors out and I get square root of G M over R three. And let me see if I have it right. This M0 should have canceled somehow. Of course, M0 is 1, so we don't care. Uh, why did it not cancel? I think in the fine dots, there should be also an M0 squared to Okay, <laughs> because we, we assume that M0 is is here. So it cancels out, so now the question is how does it cancel so that, uh, uh, well, let, let me just not try to invent but write the, the right formula. Uh, well, actually, uh, we know what the right formula is, right? We, know, we need an M0 here, right? I mean, that's, uh, so, so in other words, there'll be an M0 here, and, um, and now it should work. Yeah, so this, uh, this M node cancels out. Good. Thanks a lot. So, so there is a simple formula for the frequency. If you know, uh, if you have a spherical Keplerian orbit, you know its radius, you know its frequency. Or if you know the radius and the frequency, you know the mass of the object. So that's uh, how you can determine the masses of planets. Good. So, well, this Newtonian physics is much more exhausting than general relativity. I don't know if you agree with this, but um, this is my... A view on this and now how much time do we have? Um, uh, we have 15 minutes so it's probably good enough to, it's never a good idea to start uh, to cover two topics in a single lecture uh, but then it's uh, never a good idea to waste uh, 15 minutes uh, of a lecture in a lecture course which is already a bit stretched. We're going to be on holidays uh, is this next week? Yeah, so next uh, Thursday is dropping out, and then there'll be another Thursday dropping out in June. So let's uh, use these 15 minutes. Uh, and these 15 minutes, uh, I've already told you the color. We're doing this Keplerian orbits because we want to compare the whole business with geodesics in Schwarzschild. So remember one of the fundamental postulates uh, or ideas or axioms or facts in general relativity is that test objects move on geodesics. A test, a test object is an object that doesn't create its own gravitational field. So, of course, if you think about the Earth, it's a nonsense hypothesis that the Earth does not create its own gravitational field. Nevertheless, at a first approximation, given the size of the Earth compared to the, well, the mass of the Earth compared to the ma mass of, of, of the Sun, one could think that uh, this should still work. Uh, Well, maybe actually it's not that convincing uh, an argument. But somehow you say, well, forget that the Earth, replace Earth by a point weightless particle and see how it will move. 
or replace mercury by a point massless particle and see how it moves and see what happens, right? And so whether this uh, feeds with GR. And so in other words, geodesics. So, uh, Ivan, I you need your help again. New paragraph. Geodesics in. So. Would be 4.10. 4.10, okay. Thanks. So, geodesics in Schwarzschild. So, regardless of. Uh, uh, the physical interest, if you think about. Uh, orbits of uh, planets around the Sun, or orbits of stars around Sagittarius A star, or orbits of uh, stars around the center of our galaxy, uh, then uh, uh, studying of geodesics is a natural thing in any uh, in, in differential geometry, right? So you have a metric, how do you study this? There's a natural equation, the geodesic equation, so regardless of any physical meaning, you can just study this equation. So if you don't like thinking in terms of planets, just think about what do I know about motion on geodesics in this geometry? Now, uh, so geodesics, uh, uh, so right, so a, a question, so aim is just uh, uh, solve as much as possible. Uh, and of course, it's not going to be that easy, but uh, the e equations for geodesics, right? The uh, geodesic equation and the equation is the one you know. And this is uh, not just a geodesic equation, but a finely parameterized geodesic equation. You would have a, you could have a velocity term here in general. So we have the S is a uh, proper time, if time-like, right? Proper time if uh, time-like. So one way to do this is just to take the metric, calculate the gammas, and do it. But that's a, a silly idea, because the good way actually to calculate the gammas is to write down the geodesic equation from the like, variational principle. So that's what we're going to, to do now. So the action would be the integral over S of uh, M0 if you want to, but we're going to set it equal to 1. Uh, G of uh, uh, G alpha beta uh, of X of S, DX alpha over DS, DX beta over DS. Yes, so this is uh, uh, the Lagrangian. So we view i as a functional of uh, this trajectory, right, of x of s. So the earlier Lagrange equations d 
dl over dx dot mu is dl over dx mu. So we have these equations and we work out what, what, uh, what's happening, right? So, uh, yeah, so normally this M0 could be absorbed in Lagrangian, right? If you think about, uh, would be part of the Lagrangian. Uh, if you think of uh, classical mechanics, the Lagrangian is one half of the kinetic energy square. So that looks a bit like uh, one half of the kinetic energy square. Uh, if you used M0 here. Uh, good, so let's see. So, uh, and what is the metric? So in our case, uh, the action is therefore uh, the Schwarzschild action, which is, um, yes, so uh, integral of one half and then GTT. So let me just remind you what the metric is, minus uh, V dt square plus dr square over v plus r square d omega square, where this is the metric uh, on the sphere. So we get minus v, uh, which is a function of r, right? So v is v of r, which is 1 minus 2m over r. So minus v of r dt over ds square plus 1 over v of r dr over ds square plus r square d theta over ds. <sighs> this is the, uh, ah, terrible, terrible. That's the Euler Lagrange equations. Uh, thank you for not shouting so that I don't have to increase my mistake counter today. But obviously I should, right? So, yeah, x dot being, uh, of course, x dot is dx over ds. Good. So d theta over ds square plus sine one square of theta d phi over ds. square ds. So this is my Lagrangian and I need to work out the Euler Lagrange equations and uh, in the remaining seven minutes we'll just be able to uh, write them and maybe make an argument which is relevant for what follows. So uh, I need the room here so let me just Erase this. Um, so the uh, if we just use uh, one with uh, x mu is equal phi, so the phi coordinate. So the Lagrangian here does not depend on dl over d phi uh, on phi. So right, it depends upon r and on theta but doesn't depend upon t and doesn't depend upon phi. So uh, we get a conservation law out of this, d over ds, dl over d phi dot is zero. And what's dl over d phi dot? Well, this is this very clever one half which cancels the square from here. Uh, but so this is d over ds of, uh, well, r square is here, sine square theta is here, and this gives me uh, 2 phi dot dot, uh, phi dot, right? Well, I already have the zero here, so there's not much point of repeating this. Uh, yes, yeah, so once again, Nothing depends upon phi, so dl over d phi is zero. Then I have a d over ds, dl over d phi dot, which is zero. And dl over d phi dot, there's a one half 
which will cancel with this two. Uh, there is a R square, which is here. This R square, okay, good. So a conservation law, uh, obviously conservation of angular momentum, right? So something that we looks very much uh, like before. There exists a constant J so that R square sine square theta phi dot is J and constant in the sense, it does not depend upon s, right? So we get an equation for phi dot if we uh, uh, if we know what r and theta is, then we know j. Uh, we know phi dot, and uh, this is let's let it be our equation. Well, let this be equation one. Will be the Lagrangian. No, uh, this is equation two. So this is going to be equation three. And uh, if you look at the, the Newtonian calculation, uh, this is the same as our definition of Newtonian uh, angular momentum, except that m0 is 1, okay? if you take our equation. And theta, sine theta is, uh, uh, is 1, because uh, in the previous case, we were on a, on a plane. So that would give the same equation. Good. So now the main point today, and I think I'm going to stop there, is to show you that theta, uh, that the motion is planar again. Okay. So this is what we want to, to do now. And for this, I need to erase. Uh, hmm. I need to erase a lot. So let's see. So the next thing to do is just to look to the, for the Euler-Lagrange equation when x mu is theta, okay? So you can start thinking about this uh, while I'm trying to get a little room on this blackboard to write on. Let's see if it will work. If I just do it like that. We saw the machine from hell. Okay, good. So the quality of uh, this blackboard will not be up to my standards, but uh, at least uh, this should be good enough to finish this lecture. So we just look at d over d. Uh, so the Lagrange, Euler Lagrange uh, for theta uh, with uh, x mu equal theta. Then I get so dl d over ds dl over dx uh, theta dot is equal dl over d theta. So this requires a little more work than before because dl over d theta would be non-zero. Uh, so from this term we get with the one half d over ds of um, r square uh, d theta over ds square. Uh, no, well, d theta over ds uh, is equal uh, the derivative of this term. So the derivative of sine is sine cos. Well, sine square gives me two sine cos, and there's a two which cancels out. Two sine theta cos theta and d phi over ds square. So good, so I'm out of time. So uh, I think I, don't, I will not finish my argument, uh, but uh, so let me tell you what this is about. So the claim is, uh, and we'll do it next time, that the motion is planar motion. Uh, without loss of generality, we can choose our coordinates so that 
theta is pi half. We can rotate coordinates. So that theta of s is pi half for all s, right? So the motion takes place in the equatorial plane. And the argument for this will be that uh, theta equal pi half uh, is equal pi half for all times. Solve this equation. Because if theta is pi half, then this is 0. No, this is, the, is this one, but this one is 0, right? Cos theta is 0. So the right hand side is 0. d theta over d s is constant. So this equation is solved by uh, theta s equal pi half. And uh, so a solution which has initially theta equal pi half and the derivative of theta initially equals 0. Uh, 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 so, well, so theta s pi half is a solution of the initial value problem. This equation plus theta of s equal pi half and theta dot equals zero. By uniqueness of solutions, uh, then this is a solution, all right? So an argument like that, I'm going to repeat it next time. Uh, apologies for going over time and uh, yeah, I shouldn't have started this uh, today, but well, we can always repeat and uh, Repetition is the heart of learning anyway. So any questions about our lecture today? If not, have a great sunny weekend, and uh, I'll see you Tuesday. Bye-bye.